Acts chapter 2. This is after the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit had come and baptized people. And um, <clears throat> it was, it was an, another indicator of the Spirit in the lives of people. So um, here's what Luke writes that happens to the people that accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You might not be familiar with this particular passage of Scripture, but if you are, the day of Pentecost, the Spirit comes down, and people think that the, the apostles are, are drunk. And what does Peter do? He stands up and he says, these men are not drunk as you suppose, right? And then he gives them a sermon. And the Bible uses this word. It says they were cut to the heart. And then they ask, what, sh what should we do? And then Peter says, this is what you should do. You should repent. You should repent from this wicked generation, right? And give your heart. Give your heart to the Lord. And be baptized, right? For those of you that have not been baptized, this is a good moment for you to, to adhere. Maybe, you know, come to Fresh Start class and, and get baptized. And, and, and then here's the action of the people that received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's powerful. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says, they, de they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the one many wonders and the signs performed by the apostles. It says, verse 44, it says, all the believers, that's all the people that were cut to the heart, they gave their heart to Jesus Christ, were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now you can see all the indicators, right? All, all the, the, the processes that happen when the Holy Spirit comes into the life of people. Here we're going to continue in, in, in 2 Corinthians 9. It says, and there is no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people. For I know your eagerness to help. And I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians. Telling them that since, your, since last year you and Achaia were ready to give. And your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I'm sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of have been so confident. So I thought it is necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the, the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not one grudgingly given. And he continues, he says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having that you need, all that you need, you will abound in every good work, as it is written. Now he's, now he's quoting the prophets. You, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will, will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions and thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity, generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Oh my gosh, a lot of scripture. But can you see the story that's building up? Can you see what the Holy Spirit does in the book of Acts and how it continues in Paul's missionary journeys to the church of Corinth? 
the spirit of generosity, the spirit of giving. In the book of Acts, they sold their possessions. They gave to people in need. There was this generosity of their time. They broke bread together. They, they sat with the apostles and they devoted themselves to the teaching. So, again, as we learned last week, there's indicators of a spirit-filled life. And so we're going to learn uh, this, this morning another indicator. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you continue to move in our hearts and our lives. God, as, as your scripture teaches so many subjects and so many topics, God, as we learn the topic of generosity today, God, I pray that our church would be a church that lives in, in grace. It would be a church that lives in the grace giving of the Lord. God, that we would not be people that <clears throat> withhold, but we be people, Lord God, that show our faith through how we're generous, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing in our lives. In your holy name we pray, amen and amen. Well, high five your neighbor and say, God is with you. Come on. God is, we got to say with some conviction, God is with you. We learned last week that, that Jesus had to go away so that the spirit, the advocator can come. And so that is what, that is what scripture teaches us that God is living in us. And Jesus says it himself. He says, if I go and you obey my commands and you love me, he says, we, he uses that pronoun, we will come and live in you, the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. And so that's where we are today is the Holy Spirit living in us. So I have a question for you. Why, why is being generous so difficult? You ever thought about that? Some of us might feel like, well, I am generous. Well, if you are, then praise the Lord. But I tend to find in the 25 plus years that I've been in ministry that most people are not generous. Most people are not generous. It's, it, being generous is a very difficult thing. But here's, here's another question. Why is being greedy so easy? Why is holding what I have to myself and hoarding it and keeping it so easy? You ever ask yourself that? Most people actually, when you do the, the study and you, you, you look at it from a psychological point of view, most people actually don't think about being selfish or being generous. They think themselves just, just normal, a good person. But here's the Bible. And the Bible gives us a clear, a clear contrast from a generous person and a person who is a selfish person. In fact, Jesus says in his work, Jesus says in his teaching, he's like, listen, you need to watch out for all kinds of greed. If there's anything that Jesus could have talked about, he, he chose the idea of greed, being selfish, being self-centered, having this idea that the world revolves around me, right? All that's a greedy attitude. Greedy is not just holding your money back. Greed comes in so many different forms. And when the people of God are not living in grace, when we're not living full of the spirit, then the church of God, the, the collective uh, group of us, we, we, we set the atmosphere of being a greedy church rather than a generous church. And, and the spirit doesn't want us to do that. The spirit doesn't want us to live that way. Here's, here's a play on words. It's kind of cheesy, but I, I found it, and I, I think it, it kind of works, right? So it's like this idea where generosity, right, starts with the letter G, and so does God start with the letter G, right? But selfishness starts with the letter S, and so does Satan. Starts with the letter S. I know it seems cheesy, but if I can just get that in your thought process and go, listen, the more I am selfish, the more my character lines up with Satan. You ever think of it that way? The more I am generous, the more my character lines up with God. And, and we, we want to be generous people. We, we want people to see us and go, man, those people are, are generous. If you ask them for anything, if they have it, they will give it. And here's, here's I think here's the, 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 the kind of in my opinion, the sad part of generosity because we, we kind of think of generosity just always within a, a money sense, right? It's like, I just want to be generous, but I don't have the money. And so then you withhold. 
You withhold what you can actually give. You withhold your time. You withhold your, your forgiveness. You withhold those things that you could be generous with. And I'm here to teach you this morning that generosity, it, it doesn't just start and end with our money, but it, it, it bleeds into every area of our life, right? You could be generous with a smile. Some of us, it, 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 it like, it'll break our soul to smile. It's like, I don't want to smile, man. I just want people to think I'm mad all the time, right? But you can be generous with a smile. A smile goes a long way. If people are having a bad day and you just smile at them, you don't know what you're doing. But because you were generous with your smile, right? Some of you, it's hard to smile. It's like, you're like literally fighting your cheeks from, from, from smiling. See, but I, I want us, as a, as a church, I want us to be... A, a biblical group of people. And in order to be a biblical group of people, we can't just focus on those areas of the Bible where it's like, it makes me feel good, right? It's like, I want all the things that God's gonna do in my life that makes me feel good. Like like the songs that we sing, right? I, I, I stand secure and promise because he's surrounding the thing that's surrounding me. But if you study the Bible, you'll know that God puts his people, he puts his people in in positions to always be tested. Because he wants to know where your faith lies. He wants, he wants to mature us. He wants to challenge us. And so the testing of generosity is no different. God gives you opportunity. We read it in Corinthians. It's like there's opportunity for us to be generous on all occasions, at all times, there's opportunity for us to be generous. And if we withhold that, the test that the Lord puts our life in, then he begins to withhold his blessings as a father. If he's a good, good father, then he's going to discipline us, the Bible says. God disciplines those he loves. But one thing I learned about generosity is that it's contagious. It's like laughing. You ever sit in a room and, and if you're just in a bad mood and someone just heard a funny joke or someone saw something funny and they just, they're laughing so hard that you're like, why is that person laughing? And before you know it, you start laughing. You're just laughing. You have no reason why you're laughing. It's like everyone else in the room's laughing. It's like, let me laugh. And so that's what generosity does. It's contagious, like laughing. When a group of people are generous, it, is, it changes the atmosphere. It changes the way we worship. It changes the way people that are new to the church that might come in as a visitor, they receive a different type of spirit in this place because we're generous. It's contagious. It's contagious. And so we want to be generous people. So these, I have these ideas for us here out of, out of the passages that we read. So the first idea is generosity is contagious. And, and as, as a born-again believer, there's a passion in our life. So in Revelation, the church of, the church of Ephesus, right, the church of Asia, they, they, there are seven churches, and one of the churches gets, gets this, this call out. And it's like, you're doing all these good things, but there's one thing that you need to do, and that's return to your first love. It's return to your first love. Do you remember the first time you got saved? Do you remember the first time you gave your heart to Jesus? You had such zeal, such passion. There was this enthusiasm about you. There was this willingness to do and go anywhere that the Lord would send you, right? And, and, and so that's contagious. One, one of the challenges, I think, for Christianity, Christianity is longevity, is serving the Lord for so many years. We, we can become dormant, stagnant. We, we can become, we can put ourselves on autopilot and we're just cruising down this highway of life and there's no passion about your life for the things of God. But did you know that generosity can change that? If you start practicing generosity, you start practicing what it means to give your life again, what it, what it means to pour your hours into the things of God, pour your hours into people's lives, that's generosity. 
and it becomes contagious. And not only in your life, but in the life of, of the people around you. As we just read from, from Corinthians, Paul's like, listen, if you're generous, God's going to supply all your needs on all occasion. And the people around you are going to notice. They're going to notice. And they are going to become, they're going to be affected by your generosity. And so, here, here is, here's what he says in Acts 2. I mean, excuse me, Corinthians 2. Nine, he says, for I know your eagerness to help, and I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. It's like, because they heard. So there's Corinth, little city Corinth, and then there's the providence of Achaia, where Galatia is. They heard about the generosity of the Corinthians and it motivated them. They wanted to be a part. They wanted to take part in giving an offering. Here's what Hebrews 10 says. It says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more so as you see the day approaching. Here's Paul. He's like, I told them the need, and they were eager, and they were, in, they were excited to give. And their enthusiasm, it, it stirred most of other people to give. He writes in Hebrews, he says, listen, we have to think about ways to spur one another on. We have to think about ways how to encourage each other, not to, not to give up the meeting of one another as the day approaches. We have to, we have to encourage one another to do good. That's the generosity, contagiousness of our life. It's when the Spirit lives in us. It's no longer about us, but now, how may I spur you on? How may I encourage you to do what God wants you to do in your life? Because generosity is contagious. And when you remember, back to when you first got saved, when you remember how eager you were for people to know about your relationship with Jesus, right? So, so think about that memory and then compare that person, the person that first fell in love with Jesus to the person you are today. Is your enthusiasm the same? Is your excitement for the things of God the same? Because if they are, then praise the Lord because that's what it should be. In fact, it should be even better. But if they're not, in the comparison of the the person that got saved years ago or months ago or weeks ago, they, that fire, you know, is not burning anymore. And that's a good indicator. It's a good indicator that we're, we have slowly pulled away from the things of God. Because when you're full of the Spirit, there's this generosity that flows out of your life. And you're passionate and you're excited about the things of God. A passionate Christian, listen, can motivate people to pray. A passionate Christian can motivate people to serve, can motivate people to give. A passionate Christian, they, they can motivate people to invite other people to church. When's the last time you've had any type of evangelism in your life where you're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ or you're inviting people to come and partake and hear the word of hope? is contagious. Here's the second point is generosity enriches us and enriches our lives. Makes you better. Like anything else in your life, like any discipline in your life, you, if, if you don't practice generosity, it will not happen. It will not happen. And Paul's words of encouragement for them to be enriched in every way, this is what he says. He says, remember this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap gener generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need abound in every good work. And we skip down to verse 11. It says, and you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result 
in thanksgiving to God. Here's Paul. He's like, listen, if, if you sow, you sow. The level that you sow, the level that you decide that you want to give is the level that your life is going to be enriched. He, he connects the two ideas. It's like you'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. On every occasion. Could you imagine that your life, your life has everything it needs whenever you need it? It's literally what the Bible's saying. Have everything you need when you need it. But that starts with generosity. There's, there's, this, there's this idea where, where grace, right? Grace is freely given, right? It's, it's, it's not based on any merit that you have. And, and <clears throat> I think sometimes the church of God, we confuse the grace with works because we say, well, we're not saved by works. So I want us to think about this. When, when we are talking about salvation, how does a person go to heaven? How does a person spend eternity with God? Well, that's by grace. Paul says no one, no one can earn that salvation. It is by grace. It is the good merit that God has given us by his son, Jesus Christ. So what do we do? How do we engage with that grace? Well, that's through faith. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and he died on the cross and God raised him from the dead for my sins, right? We take personal responsibility for my sins. Now that's salvation. And, and here's works because the Bible talks about works all the time in scripture. In fact, we just read it out of Corinthians, right? That you'll be generous on every occasion so that you can produce good works out of your life, out of your life. James says, he's like, listen, if you have faith, I have works. Faith without works is dead. So I think this, is, this needs to be very clear to our hearts. Salvation comes by grace. No one, you can't earn that. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't, you can't do so many good deeds so that you can get into heaven. That is only by grace and faith alone. Salvation. But now that you are saved and the spirit of God lives in you, now there are works that need to come out of your life. And those works are not for your salvation because we already received salvation freely from Jesus and from God the Father and the Holy Spirit. But now we have to work. And generosity enriches us. And when we enrich, when we have an enriched life, Paul's saying that we're working. We're working. We're doing things for the kingdom of God. You want, if you are a lazy person, or you know someone who's lazy, you look at their life and you go, man, I am not accomplishing anything right now. There's like no work out of my life. And because there's no work out of my life, you it, lazy people slip into this depression because that's not how they were designed. They were designed to produce things. And so generosity in our life enriches us. It enriches us because we're doing good deeds. We are, we are engaging with the kingdom of God. I, I need to be clear about that. This is not just doing random works in your life, but you're engaging with the kingdom of God to advance the kingdom of God. That's what spiritual generosity is. Like, I'm going to give my life so that the kingdom of God will flourish. What does Jesus say? He says, there's no greater love than this than a person who lays down his life for someone else. Every time you are, you are living a generous life and you're giving of yourself, that means you're laying down your life for people that, that are going to come into this, this atmosphere of worship. Maybe for the first time. Maybe they return, they've been gone forever. But this is the atmosphere that you and I create from our hearts of generosity, from our spirit that engages with God. We are responsible for it. And so, 
he's like, you'll be enriched in every way so that you'll be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And we read it earlier, Luke 6 says, given, it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It will be poured out into your lap for the measure that you use will be measured against you. Be measured against you. So there's these principles that are that are at work in our generosity and the principle of increase is we will reap in the measure that we sow. As you heard me say during the tithe and offering, it's like, it's like the, if the farmer wants a big harvest, well, he's going to have to put a lot of seed down. If the investor wants a big, a big return, he's going to have to put a lot of money in the stock market. I was thinking about this point, <laughs> this, this idea of Las Vegas came into my mind. Now, you don't have to raise your hand if you've ever been to Las Vegas because we already know. We already know, right? Or any casino, right? If you've been to Kickapoo or some other casino, we already know, right? It's like, if you live long enough, you've been there at least once. You go, okay, I see this idea, right? I see this idea of all these people going into a casino and they're just laying down their money in hopes of what? In hopes of hitting the jackpot, right? No matter what game they're playing, they're like, man, I'm going to lay down this $15. I'm going to lay down this $100, right? In hopes of winning. That's why you go, right? That's why people gamble. It's like, oh, man, it's a gamble, but what's 15 in return to 1,000? Right? Like, I'm willing to pay that price, that odd. But here's the concept. It's like, if you want to win big, you need to what? You already know, don't you? See, I knew you'd been there. <laughs> if you want to win big, you need to bet big. Right? If you win small, it's because you bet small. It's like, I bet 15 bucks, so you got $10. Like, oh, man, what kind of return is that? That's the idea. And here's, and here's Jesus. He's saying, listen, the measure in which you give, here's a biblical principle that the world has taken and they've corrupted. The biblical principle is the measure. If you give large, you're going to receive large. But the world, like we do, right, the world, what we do is we, we pervert it, we twist it, we, we take a biblical principle and, and we use it for our own gain and our own good. And that's what gambling does, right? It, 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 it like hits the heart of a greedy person. And so here's Jesus. He's like, you want, if you want heaven to release large blessings in your life, well, then you need to give large blessings. Not just in the church, not just in your tithe and offering. It's beyond that. It's, it's, it's with your relationships. It's with people at work, helping your coworker, you know, advance rather than you just advancing. Like, we don't think that way. It's just like, it's, it's, it's beyond us to think like, man, I could actually help this person get the next promotion. But if I do that, then I'm going to be looked over. And here's God. He's like, he's like, oh, you see, the problem with your generosity is that it's, it's attached to this earthly thing. But if you trust me, if you trust me, even though that person gets the blessing, I'll take care of your needs. That's a big measure. Think about that. That's a big measure that I have just given someone else so that their life can advance. That's literally laying down your life for someone else. And what is, and you're like, you're worried about your finances, and here's God. He's going, hey, I'm going to enrich your life on every occasion. On every occasion, your life's going to be enriched. And he's going to give you something money can't buy. He's going to give you peace of mind. He's going to give you joy. He's going to give you something that money cannot, cannot deposit in your heart. Assurance. Assurance that he is with you. See, the, the, it's the principle of increase. The principle of intent is, is we reap as we sow with the right motive. Listen, God doesn't, God doesn't want us to be sad givers, right, who are grungently giving to the kingdom. He doesn't want sad givers. He doesn't want mad givers who, who do it out of, 
they do it out of just discipline. They're angry at the, fact, at the fact that they have to do it. No, the Bible says that he wants cheerful givers, that he loves cheerful givers, people who are willing to give. I love the story in Acts chapter 2. That's why I read it to you is because these people, these people show up. They show up for the day of Pentecost, and they travel from all over the world to come and offer their sacrifices, Jews. And when they receive salvation, when they receive salvation, it was the 120 that got baptized in the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. It's the, it's the 3,000 that received salvation. Those are the ones that were cut to the heart. See, there's a different, there's a different spiritual principle at work there. And, and the people that were cut to the heart and they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they repented. No one had to tell them, you should go to discipleship class. No one had to tell them, you should probably fellowship with other believers. No one had to tell them, you should probably sell your possessions and your property so that you can give it. Are you, are you catching it here? See, when the Holy Spirit, and when you're living full of the Holy Spirit in your life, no one has to tell you that you should probably volunteer in your church. Because the Spirit's telling you. No one has to tell you that you should probably give tithes and offering to support your church. Because the Spirit's telling you. No one should tell, have to tell us we should break bread with one another in fellowship. Why? Because the Spirit tells you. You see the difference? Being a sad giver? Begrudgingly? Being an angry giver? Oh, I don't want to do this. God's always asking money from me. He's always asking my time. He's always asking me to forgive people. Like, and you do it anyway. You do it out of anger. Versus the person who does it cheerfully. And the person who does it, does it with a peace of heart, with the right motive. The right motive. The motive is, man, I'm full of this. The spirit lives in me. I enjoy giving. I enjoy watching other people receive. I enjoy watching their eyes light up when a need is met because God has given me the opportunity to meet a need. I enjoy when my church flourishes because, because they have the resources and the funds in the house to do ministry in our community. I enjoy, and it, and it brings joy to my heart. That's being filled with the Spirit. That's, that's, that's reaping and sowing because you have the right motive. And the motive is to please the Lord. The motive is to serve God. The motive is not to be noticed by other people, right, but to be noticed by God. Jesus even identifies this. He says, listen, when you give, don't practice your righteousness in front of people. Don't be like the hypocrites who do it in the synagogue who do it in public? No, do it in secret. He says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. When you do it, when you give to the Lord, do it in secret. And God will reward you. The, Jesus says that there's reward for when we give to the kingdom of God. There's reward in our life. There's reward in our soul for this, this, this level of generosity. He's like, people who practice their righteousness, I need you to get this. Right? They, those are the angry givers. Those are the sad givers. Those are the people that want other people to notice how, how righteous they are. When they practice their righteousness in public, Jesus says they've received their full reward. The reward that everybody knows. The reward that everybody looks at them as a, as a person of righteousness, a person, you know, of generosity. They've received their reward. That, that's how far it goes. But if you do it in secret, your father sees you and he will reward you. And I don't know about you, but I would rather receive a reward from God than an applause from man. I mean, it's a no-brainer. It's like I'd rather God reward me than, than to receive a thousand thank yous from everyone that I know. It's the motive. How are you giving? There's the principle of proximity. It's like all things at all times. He says this, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, 
not reluctant or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need will abound in every good work. There's that, there's that word again, work. There's work. But here's the thing, the Holy Spirit's not going to leave you wanting. He's not going to leave you without. He's going to bless you beyond so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, not what you want, what you need, I think that's very different. We want a lot of things, but our needs are met. It's the gift, the grace of God enriches us morally and spiritually so that, so that we may grow our character in Christ. Are you okay? Talk to me. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if y'all are thinking or you're, or you're getting upset with me. But here's, 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 here's another point, and then we're going we're gonna to bring it to a close. Because generosity meets needs. It meets needs. When we're generous out of our life, we meet needs. It's... So... When you are driving and you see the homeless guy on the street and you have this attitude, you have this mindset, like, man, I have money. I hope he doesn't come to my window because I don't like that tension. I don't like that pressure. And I hope he doesn't make eye contact with me because that's more tension more pressure and if your thoughts are I have this money but if I give it to him I know what he's going to do with it right he's going to go buy drugs or he's going to go buy a beer so we we want to control we want to control the scenario and that's not what generosity does generosity meets needs it's not it's not do I do I determine the need? Well, no, you don't. You're the one that God gave seed to so that you can meet the need. And the need is this person, this homeless person is standing on the street corner and needs funds. And whatever he does with it is between him and God. We don't get to judge. We don't get to decide and go, well, I'm not going to give him money because I already know what he's going to do with it. It's a big assumption based on his, his position in life. No, we have been given seed so that we can take opportunity on all occasions to be a blessing to all people. It doesn't matter if it's a dollar that you give them or it's a $50 bill. It doesn't, doesn't matter. We don't get to control the need. What we do is we get to be a, 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 a conduit for heaven to bring seed into our life so that it flows right out of us. And the moment that we begin to decide whether that's a real and legitimate need in someone's life, we begin to bottleneck our conduit. And you wonder why God doesn't bring blessing into your life? is because you bottlenecked the conduit. You decided what a need was. You decided that, you know what, you didn't want your money to go to these things over here. No, no. God gives you the seed so that it can flow through you so you can meet a need. You can meet a need. Jesus says it this way. He says, when you give water to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Unto me. You see, there's a connection. There's a spiritual connection that happens in this physical world that Jesus says, whatever you do to the least of these, you're doing to me in the spiritual. And so, a lot of times we have, we have church people that don't give in the offering because we in our minds we go well they don't have a need and here's Jesus he's like you don't get to decide I gave you the seed so that you can release and be a blessing and what, and what the church does and what the leadership does we answer to God for that our responsibility is like I'm going to give I'm going to give because my church has needs. Y'all are quiet. Are you okay? Yes? Yeah. 
And here, here's the thing about needs. It's like, it's like we, we look at our church and we go, and now I'm going to make it very personal for us, right? As a church, we look at our church and you walk in this building and you go, man, there must be a lot of rich people here because this building's gorgeous and we'll let all the rich people pay the needs. And that's unbiblical. One, it's a bad attitude. Two, it's not what God has called us to do. But let me help you. We are not rich. Our church is not funded by millionaires. Our church doesn't have a mother church somewhere else that's, that's, that's funding the, the ministry here at LFA. We are what they call a sovereign church. And so whatever the church congregation gives is what meets the needs of the house. That's the way our denomination works. We're not like the Catholic church where the Catholic church has the mother church and, and, the, and the mother church supports all the little churches. It doesn't work that way. What we do is what you have given. And if you're not giving, you're not meeting the need. And here's, here's the thing about that. It's, it's like, well, I let someone else give. And, and, and that's not what generosity is. Generosity is like, the Lord has blessed me. And if you have a job, the Lord has blessed you. He has given you seed. That's seed in your life. And, and then for us to withhold that seed, well, we bottleneck our blessing. We bottleneck our blessing in the church ultimately diminishes because we, the people of God, aren't giving the way we're supposed to be giving. Are y'all quiet? Are y'all thinking about this, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to share with you the, the honesty of our generosity, right? If we are spirit-filled people, then the church, I want you to get this, the church will never be in need because we're giving at the level that you're supposed to be giving. But when we are not living in generosity and we withhold, we withhold, then the church finds itself in a very peculiar position financially. It doesn't matter our salary because it's not about salary. Someone who makes $20,000 a year, the Bible says your tithe is $2,000. That's what you should give to the church as, as a whole. If you make $200,000, you should be giving $20,000. Are you getting this? It's the heart that it comes from. It's like the measure. And the tithe is like the floor. It's the floor because generosity is more than the tithe. And people are like, well, the tithe is Old Testament. I'm, I love people who say the tithe is Old Testament because I'm like, great. You're going to give more than the tithe. It's wonderful. If you have $100... The tithe says $10 belongs to the Lord. That's his. That's the first fruit. That's the floor. If you have $100 and you give $10, does that look generous? Not even close. Generosity would be like, if you have $100, I'm going to give $40. That's generosity. You decide. When the Holy Spirit lives in us, not only do we want to give, no one has to tell you to give. No one has to encourage you to give. No one has to try to motivate you to give. The Spirit gives through you. The Spirit wants to meet needs. But when we withhold, needs aren't met. Here's the final point. And we're done. Because generosity glorifies God. That's the ultimate goal. Is everything that we do in our life glorifies God. Everything that we do. Jesus says this in Matthew 5. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It no longer, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Again, there's that word deeds, that word works. As Jesus is saying that we as a church, we as a community of believers that follow and listen to him, we're a light. We're a light in the darkness. 
or a city on a hill. But our good deeds, our good deeds, what we do with, uh, with our life and our light should glorify God in the community in which we live. In the, in, in the job in which you serve, that your light is shining because your generosity brings glory to God. And people ask you all the time, like, why, why do you show up early? And why do you show, why do you, why are you the last one to leave? Why are you always so kind and so nice? It's like, because I've been changed. I've been changed. Changed? How? But when I gave my heart to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in me. Because he lives in me, I want to do these things. I love seeing you guys happy when I bring donuts. I love seeing you guys happy when I bring tacos. I love, it's like, man, it's, it's, it, it changes people. People who are callous and are hard, your generosity will break their, their callousness. It will break the hardness, and, and it will cause glory to be given to God. Now, they may not stand in front of you and go, well, I want to worship your God. No, it doesn't work that way. They walk away from you, and they go and they sit back down, and they ponder about your life, and they think about the things that you have. Think about the peace that surrounds your life, because they, you know how it is. When you work with someone, you're spending 40 hours a week with them. They know your calamity. They know everything that happens. It's like, how do they do it? And then, in that moment, the Holy Spirit's doing his work. Paul says you are either depositing the seed or you're pouring water. And then the Holy Spirit does his work because your generosity opened a door for their heart to receive Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. There's nothing greater on this planet is when someone accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Nothing. And we get to be part of that because of our generosity. Let's pray. Let's pray. Stand with me. Being filled with the Spirit, the indicator is one of the indicators is generosity. How do we live our life? Are we living it for others or are we living it for ourselves? Let's be a church, a generous church. Generous towards God, first and foremost. And then generous to our brothers and our sisters. And then generous to our community. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. God, we, we pray this morning, Lord, if, we, if we've been selfish, if we've been self-centered, if we've been holding back our seed, Lord God, that you've blessed us with, we want to repent of that. I want to say, Lord, that we, we want to be a conduit where you, you bless us so we can bless others. And we'll never be without. All of our needs will be met at all times, at all occasions. And Lord, that we will bring glory to your name because of generosity in our life. God, our businesses will flourish because we continue to give. God, our, our, our life, our household will continue to flourish, Lord God, financially because we continue to give. We don't, we don't want to bottleneck the conduit. But we want to release what you've given us. We want to honor you in that, Lord God. We want to steal from you. We don't want to take what is our, what is yours, Lord God. You've blessed us with so much. We want to just give it back. And we know that you'll continue to bless us. We want to be the city on a hill. We want our light to shine in the darkness. We love you, Father. We love you. We know that you constantly challenge us, Lord God, to become more like your son. Lord, give us the courage to do so. Give us the courage, Lord God, to move past this, this challenge.
things, this, this barrier in our life, Lord God, to be generous. That we would trust you. That you're the anchor in our life. Not this world, not this money that we make, but you. You. Give us the strength to execute what we need to in our lives. In your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, give you grace and peace for now and evermore. Go and live a generous life. God bless you.